Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, I'd like to welcome all of you here, the staff, uh, the media, industry folks, the public, uh, for today's meeting. Today, uh, um, we're gonna be focusing on new reactors, and as most of you know, um, the, in the last year, the NRC, the last couple years, the NRC has issued two combined uh, um, licenses, combined and operating licenses for um, the Vogel site in Georgia and for the summer site in North Carolina. And uh, the NRC staff worked very hard to get to this point, I know. Now we are in a, moving into a new phase where with the startup of construction activities, so there's a sort of a new set of inspection and oversight that is occurring now, and, um, and I'm looking forward to hearing more about what's happening on that topic. Um, what we're gonna be doing today is having two panels this morning uh, before we uh, enter into the question form um, period. And the, the two panels are uh, in, uh, in two general topic areas. So the first panel, we're gonna hear a discussion of topics associated with the uh, light water reacting li reactor licensing, siting reviews, and small modular reactors. Then we will change out some seats, and um, it will be followed by a panel discussion on uh, the construction oversight and vendor inspection. So um, first of all, let me turn to my uh, colleagues and see if anybody has uh, opening remarks. No, okay. All right, then we will just plow ahead, and I will turn it over to um, the EDO, Bill Borchard. Well, good morning. The uh, topic we're here to discuss today is uh, new reactor licensing and the inspection program. We're gonna have to change the name because this new process began in the 1980s. We actually certified the first design in the 1990s, and uh, as you mentioned, recently issued the first combined licenses. The uh, work that's been accomplished by the staff, I would like to uh, commend the uh, quality of their work over the, over the many years. They, I think, have done a remarkable job of not only doing detailed technical reviews, but they've also been able to anticipate many of the issues that are now facing us as we prepare to do, for the first time, construction oversight using uh, the ITAC element of this new uh, licensing process. Uh, I think they've done a remarkably good job of, of putting in place the infrastructure and the processes that will uh, enable the NRC to uh, be prepared to do the inspections when they need to be done and to uh, support the uh, licensees construction program. As I mentioned, this has been the effort of many offices, not just the Office of New Reactors, but uh, support from other program offices as well as from the general counsel. Um, if you would allow me just uh, one additional minute, I'd like to acknowledge the presence of two NRC individuals, Ron Gardner and Tony Cerny, who are over to your left. I think they're still there. Yes, they are. Um, they are uh, a wealth of experience. Uh, they did construction inspection in the 1970s and 80s, and they have uh, w continued to work with us in the, as a rehired annuitant uh, for the last uh, several years to help us uh, put together a construction inspection program that took the benefit of all of the hard lessons learned from uh, years ago. And uh, I'd also like uh, to just make a special thank you to Tony Cerny, who was one of the uh, first experienced inspectors to try to train me. He failed miserably at that. <laughs> but. Uh, it was the uh, quality of people like Tony and Ron that uh, when you first came to work at the NRC in the 1980s that you recognized, um, excuse me, what a uh, valuable set of individuals there are and uh, the technical expertise that they brought to their job. So I'd like to uh, thank them and uh, those that they represent for all their work over the many years. So with that, I'd like to uh, turn to Glenn who will begin the briefing. Thanks, Bill. Good morning, Chairman, Commissioners. In today's briefing, I will present the current state and plans to address the future challenges in the new reactor program, including potential policy issues 
that, uh, that we may see over the next three to five years. The new reactor business line is comprised of 564 full-time equivalent and 65 million contract dollars. It's enabled by a strong network of collaboration with the offices of the General Counsel, Nuclear Reactor Regulation, Research, Nuclear Security and Incident Response, Investigations, Enforcement, and the Regions, especially Region 2. We want to specifically acknowledge our thanks to the Office of Public Affairs and to the Office of International Programs, noting their support of our international engagements and vendor oversight and our other important activities, such as our participation in the Multinational Design Evaluation Program. Additionally, I would certainly note that uh, without the dedicated support of our corporate office partners, we would not be able to achieve our mission. Next slide, please. Today, the leadership of each major activity will present the status and challenges in their specific areas of responsibility. I will first provide an overview of the new reactor program. Dave Matthews, the director of the Division of New Reactor Licensing, will discuss plans and policy matters in the area of licensing the new large light water reactors. Mike Mayfield, the director of the Division Advanced Reactors and Rulemaking, will then describe plans to address foreseeable challenges in small modular reactors and advanced reactors. Next slide, please. Scott Flanders, the director of the Division of Site Safety and Environmental Analysis, will provide insights regarding the agency's review of siting and environmental impacts for both large light water reactors and small modular reactors. In the second half of our meeting, we'll have an in-depth briefing of the status and future of our vendor and construction oversight programs. That will include Laura Dudes and Rick Rasmussen from the Division of Construction Inspection and Operational Programs, as well as Vic McCree and Justin Fuller from Region 2. Justin Fuller, Rasheen Jackson, and Tommy Nazario, there's Tommy, are the senior resident inspectors from Vogel, Summer, and Watts Bar, respectively. We're extremely pleased to have them with us today and hear in their discussion the insights to the all-important field operations of the construction inspection program. Next slide, please. In 2009, the new reactor program was challenged with several competing priorities, several design certification and early site permit applications, 18 combined license applications, the development of a construction and vendor uh, inspection program, and preparations to review advanced reactors. We determined it was necessary to set specific goals to ensure that we focused on the right activities that would ensure the success for the overall program. We identified three goals. The first goal was to safely complete design certifications, limited work authorizations, and combined license applications needed for plants expected to operate in 2017. We met that goal by safely completing the AP1000 design certification amendment, the first ever combined licensees under Part 52, limited work authorizations that allowed the start of safety-related construction at both Vogel and Summer. The staff also met milestones for three other design certifications, 10 combined license applications, one early site permit, and two applications to renew one design certification. Next slide, please. The second goal was to develop the necessary construction inspection and vendor oversight infrastructure to implement new reactor construction oversight. We met that goal, and today we have highly qualified construction inspectors on site. Furthermore, we developed the infrastructure to support inspection scheduling, reporting, and are prepared to receive closure notifications for our inspections, tests, analysis, and acceptance criteria known as ITAC. The third goal was to establish an advanced reactor organization capable of conducting infrastructure development, pre-application reviews, and combined license reviews for the next generation nuclear power plant and other technologies. In 2008, we created the Advanced Reactor Program, a predecessor to our current division of Advanced Reactors and Rulemaking. This division has begun developing design-specific review standards, is addressing various policy issues associated with small modular reactors, and is holding pre-application interactions with potential applicants. Having met the goals we set out in 2009, we found ourselves in a transition stage. We're now in an environment where we have plants under construction, the licensing of large light water reactors is stable, and applications for small modular reactors are imminent. 
Taking these aspects into consideration, the management team set out to develop a new set of program goals for the period of 2012 through 2016. Next slide, please. We assessed the current and future environment for new reactors and using key planning assumptions to guide the development of new goals. In particular, over the next four years, there will be four AP1000 units and in collaboration with NRR, one Part 50 reactor under construction. We currently anticipate the operation of the first AP1000 unit in fiscal year 2017. As part of construction oversight, we recognize there will be an, a significant increase in the number of ITAC closure verifications as licensees work toward closing the 875 ITAC for each AP1000 unit. Next slide, please. <coughs> we realize the demands upon our staff in response to emerging licensing and technical requests will certainly increase as construction proceeds. In addition, the expertise of the siting, probabilistic risk assessment, and structural engineering review staff in the Office of New Reactors will continue support to the operating reactor program for Fukushima lessons learned over the next several years as a top priority. This is a significant workload and we must consider this in our future planning for new reactor reviews and we have communicated such both internally and externally. Next slide, please. We have considered our workload projections through 2017 and anticipate receipt of applications for one additional large light water reactor cer design certification and one additional early site permit. During 2013 and 14, we expect to receive applications for two small modular reactors and will continue to monitor developments for non-light water advanced reactors. Next slide, please. Reflecting on our prior goals, the drivers, the workload projections, and the critical elements of our future activities, our management team developed the following six new goals to guide our staff and our efforts to 2017. These prioritized goals were established on June 22nd and are being used by the new reactor program staff and leadership. Goal one, we will execute construction oversight at the four AP1000 units, including the construction inspection program, ITAC closure verification reviews, and the necessary license amendments to support the recommendation to the commission that provides the regulatory basis for the commission to make it's 10 CFR 52.103G finding for a plant ready to operate. Goal two, we'll implement the agency's reactor vendor inspection program plan, including inspection, outreach, communication to applicants, vendors, licensees, and their contractors, as well as ongoing self-assessments in support of operating reactor safety and new reactor construction. Next slide, please. Goal three, We'll develop an integrated transition plan that includes functions, licensing and construct and oversight in order to support adequate transition from construction to operations for those sites with the intent to commence operations during fiscal year 2017. Goal four reaffirms our commitment to support the completion of three large light water reactor design certifications, one early site permit, and 10 license applications requested by applicants with strong construction plans. Next slide, please. Goal five builds upon the creation of the Division of Advanced Reactors and Rulemaking and our target to have the infrastructure necessary and ready to support the licensing review and construction oversight of small modular occupations that are expected to arrive by 2014. And finally, goal six, we will establish a plan for preparing the agency for the licensing of non-light water reactors or advanced reactors and the associated full fabrication facilities by fiscal year 2016. At this point, I'd like to turn it over to Dave Matthews. As Glenn stated in his historical perspective and as Bill and the chairman remarked upon, during the last several years, the new reactor licensing activities have been principally focused <laughs> I have to move this. Principally focused on the review of applications for design certifications, early site permits, limited work authorizations, and combined licenses for large light water reactors. While we have completed reviews and issued several certifications, 
permits and licenses, there's still much work underway devoted to large light water reactors. At the risk of some repetition, at the present time we are reviewing requests for certifications for three new designs, the renewal of an existing design certification, 10 Part 52 combined license applications for 16 new units, and one Part 50 operating license application. And in addition, we're going to have an early site permit application. Um, we already have it under review and have it scheduled for completion. Next slide, please. The new reactor program goals and projections for the 2012 to 2016 timeframe that Glenn described identify an increasing number of licensing actions that will be needed during the construction of the four units that have received combined licenses. Requests for changes to the original licensing bases that were issued upon the issuance of those licenses are being submitted and are being reviewed using the existing Part 52 change processes and guidance that were developed to ensure maintenance of the plant's licensing basis during construction. An obvious concern on the part of those involved in the license review process is the potential impact of the court's remand of the Commission's waste confidence decision and temporary storage rule. The staff is developing a path forward and will be coming to the Commission shortly with an information paper to describe our approach <coughs> to implementing the Commission's order as it relates to ongoing licensing reviews and proceedings. The NRC staff intends to continue to issue draft and final environmental impact statements in support of ongoing licensing reviews. The NRC staff is developing, developing explanatory text for these EISs that will state that long-term storage and disposal of spent fuel is a generic issue that is being addressed through rulemaking. Thus, NRC's obligations under the National Environmental Policy Act regarding waste confidence will be addressed through rulemaking rather than in those individual licensing proceedings. With regard to implementation of the Commission's Fukushima initiatives, the new reactor business line is pursuing resolution of the applicable requirements and recommendations with all of the applicants prior to the completion of the design certification or combined license reviews. Next slide, please. As I mentioned earlier, the new reactor business line is giving high priority to the licensing actions for the reactors under construction. And the staff and OGC are working closely together to ensure that the review of their requested amendments are thorough and timely. Maintaining progress on pending design certification reviews and related rulemakings is essential to the timely completion of the combined license applications that have referenced these designs. By continuing to utilize what we have called design-centered review approaches, and working with the industry led by their design-centered working groups, we are identifying the critical path design issues that have highest potential to impede timely completion of the reviews. And we're providing increased management attention in those specific areas. Many of the applicants for permits and combined licenses have been stressing the importance of completing the NRC's environmental reviews in order to move forward on permitting activities by state and other federal entities in advance of the dates expected for final NRC approval of the related licensing actions. NRC is the lead agency in the environmental impact statement prepared for new reactor applications. And agencies such as the Army Corps of Engineers and the National Park Service are cooperating agencies and will rely on information in that document to support permitting activities unrelated to the specific NRC licensing decision. These expectations present schedule and resource challenges, but nevertheless, we're engaging all the affected parties with the intent of seeking timely resolution. As the construction of the newly licensed reactors progresses and the licensees ultimately look forward towards commercial operation, the staff is also looking forward in terms of its preparation for their transition from construction to operational activities. The staff has begun preliminary work to assess, <coughs> excuse me, potential future impacts to the agency as large light water reactors move from construction to operation. The staff has established a transition working group to develop an integrated plan that addresses all functions, oversight and licensing, to prepare for implementation of an effective transition from construction to operations in a seamless and transparent manner. Next slide, please. 
With regard to policy issues relating to the licensing of large light water reactors that may require commission involvement in the near future, the determination of financial qualifications has presented unanticipated difficulties for applicants that are viewed as merchant plants. Applicants for combined licenses are required to demonstrate that they possess or have reasonable assurance of obtaining the funds necessary for both construction and operation of the facility throughout its life. A challenge in the absence of identified sources of funding, the unavailability of information on the cost of financing, and uncertainties related to construction schedules. One applicant has communicated with us his views that this is a generic issue and has requested that the Commission take action to address issues related to the provisions for financial qualifications that currently exist in the regulations. <coughs> we are planning to solicit feedback from the public and industry on this issue before formulating a staff position for Commission consideration. On September 5th, we announced a public meeting that is intended to be held on October 11th to begin that process of soliciting those views in order for the staff to further formulate proposals for your ultimate consideration. With that, I'd like to turn the microphone over to Mike Mayfield. Thank you, David. Good morning, Chairman, Commissioners. Since we briefed the Commission on small modular reactors in 2010, the industry has made significant progress in developing their designs. The staff similarly has made significant process in addressing several policy issues and developing review guidance and in developing training for the staff to use on these designs. These efforts have emphasized the staff being ready to undertake the design certification reviews of the new smaller passive pressurized water reactor designs. We've been making use of the lessons learned from the large light water reactor reviews and we have been emphasizing to the small reactor vendors that they also need to learn from these reviews. We've also been considering what we would do to be able to undertake the review of non-light water reactor designs. For example, we recently prepared a report on advanced reactor licensing that the chairman forwarded to Congress last month. Overall, considering these new or newly introduced technologies and designs, many of them incorporating first-of-a-kind features are creating some unique challenges for the staff. May I have slide 20, please? This slide depicts the four small pressurized water reactor designs that are being discussed with the staff. Our near-term work is expected to include pre-application discussions with the vendors and undertaking the design certification reviews. These designs do present some interesting challenges for the staff, both in terms of the technical designs and the fabrication techniques that are being proposed. Some examples include moving components inside the reactor pressure vessel and significantly extending the time between refueling outages beyond what we see in the currently operating plants. We have held several meetings with the vendors to discuss these and other issues and have begun thinking about how we need to change our technical review process and the oversight process to, as these designs are implemented. I have the next slide, please. At the time we created the Advanced Reactor Program in late 2008, small modular reactors were seen as conceptual designs and there were many and varied opinions about their viability. Today, these projects are rapidly becoming a reality. The Department of Energy has put forward a cost-sharing program that would support two projects with a goal of having the design certified and the plants in operation by 2022. We are currently budgeted to support the two projects DOE eventually selects, but we're also considering how we could address other project that projects that may be submitted. We've been tailoring our review guidance to the specific designs through the preparation of design-specific review standards. This effort is making use of risk insights from the designs to adjust the level of emphasis in the staff's review to be more consistent with the risk and safety significance of the system structures and components that make up the designs. At this stage, I am optimistic that this approach will provide a more efficient review while maintaining our high safety expectations for any new design. The bottom line on the staff's effort is that we will be prepared to undertake the design certification reviews of these small pressurized water reactor designs and the combined license applications that reference them. We're also maintaining awareness of the developments on non-light water reactor 
designs and we'll take the steps necessary to be prepared to conduct those reviews as the time comes. While the staff has been working hard to be ready, we continue to emphasize to the industry that progress on the reviews will depend heavily on them submitting complete high quality applications and on their overall readiness to enter the review process. May I have the next slide please? We've worked with the industry and with key, inner, key NRC offices to develop approaches to numerous policy issues that have been identified. We have developed strategies and shared these strategies with the Commission through a series of papers over the last couple of years. These issues have addressed uh, such issues such as control room staffing, security, emergency planning, licensing of multi-module sites, and licensing fees, just to mention a few. Generally speaking, next steps to implement the strategies rest with the designers and with the, li the potential licensees. Potential applicants and NEI have expressed an interest to further align on the policy issue of emergency planning. However, we believe this is a licensing issue rather than a design certification issue, so there will be adequate time to discuss future industry proposals. The staff has informed industry that future work on emergency planning for small modular reactors must take into account the various designs, modularity, and co-location with other industrial facilities, as well as the size of the emergency planning zone. Next step on, steps on this issue do rest with the industry, and we know they are working to develop specific proposals to present to the staff. With that, I'll turn to Scott Flanders to discuss site safety and environmental reviews. Thank you, Mike. Good morning, Chairman, Commissioners. As Glenn stated, our division supports new reactor program, both large light water reactors and small modular reactors, as well as certain operating reactor activities, including those associated with the agency's Fukushima lessons learned activities. My presentation will discuss a few key challenges and our plans to ensure we successfully address these challenges. I will also discuss a few other key, act, key staff activities that will help assure we are well positioned to effectively support all of our ongoing and future work activities. Can I have the next slide, please? Our division is the technical lead for the near-term task force recommendation two. This effort is being led by my deputy director, Dr. Nilis Chotsky. Recommendation two includes reevaluating seismic and flooding hazards for operating reactors, conducting plant walkdowns to assess current seismic and flooding protection, and initiating rulemaking to require peri periodic reviews of external hazards. While our division is the lead, we're working closely with the Office of Nuclear Reactor Regulation and the Office of Nuclear Regulatory Research to address the technical challenges associated with the reevaluation of the hazard, and we're working closely with NRR and the regions on the walkdowns. The primary challenge we are currently focused on is adapting our current practices for new reactor seismic and flooding hazard reviews to the particular circumstances of the operating fleet. To address this challenge, and consistent with Commission direction, we are working with interested parties to develop guidance that can be used uniformly across the operating fleet to estimate the new hazard and identify risk insights that can be used to determine if the plant's design basis or licensing basis needs to be changed. We have issued one interim staff guidance for public comment, and we plan to issue a second sometime this week. In addition, we are on schedule to issue final guidance documents in November. We are also preparing to review licensee walkdown reports, the first of which are due in November, and we are also prepared to review the first group of flooding hazard reviews, which are due in March of 2013. Shifting to new reactors. Although the staff has reviewed the new reactor applications used current using current day methods, all of the applications currently under review were submitted prior to the completion of the Central and Eastern United States Seismic Source Model that operating plants will use to conduct their reevaluations. As a result, the staff has requested all new reactor applications still under review to consider how this new information will affect the seismic hazard evaluation. Some applicants have responded to this request and the staff is actively reviewing their submittals. Other applicants have either provided a proposed submittal schedule or plan to do so soon. Next, I would like to switch uh, to the next, the next key challenge I want to discuss is associated with the expected receipt of the first Part 52 application for a site in the Western U.S. Western sites pose unique challenges in the areas of seismic hazard evaluation, hydrological hazards, and meteorological conditions. 
While the existing requirements and guidance are sufficient for the staff to begin a timely review of this application, the unique siting challenges may require additional analysis. The next slide was helpful to appreciate this challenge. Can I have the next slide, please? On, it, on this next slide, you'll see that the, the blackout line covering the central and eastern um, portions of the United States. For that portion of the, of the country, uh, the NRC, working with the Department of Energy and the Electric Power Research Institute, have developed the seismic source model, which I discussed earlier. And also for that portion of the country, in the past, um, the Electric Power Research Institute and others have developed ground motion prediction models. And these models can readily be used by combined license applicants and early site permit applicants, as well as the operating fleet, to assess their seismic hazard. For the western U.S., there are several unique geologic settings which make it establishing a region model um, impractical. Therefore, establishing the appropriate ground motion levels for the western U.S. requires greater effort both on the part of the applicant to complete and for the staff to review. To help manage some of the anticipated challenges associated with the western site, the staff has already initiated pre-application activities. These early interactions should help provide for a higher quality application and a more efficient review. Can you have the next slide, please? In addition to working on the key challenges I just discussed, the staff has also undertaken some other key activities that are noteworthy. The existing siting guidance is applicable to both large light water and small modular reactor reviews. To address unique aspects related to the design of the small modular re reactors, the staff has updated several standard review plan sections and developed standard, excuse me, several design specific review standards. For example, unique technical aspects that need to be considered are establishing the appropriate source term for small modular reactors and seismic evaluations for embedded structures. While these technical aspects are not, com not complex, the staff will need different information to, to complete their review. The updated guidance addresses these additional information needs. Likewise, small modular reactor reviews present unique considerations for the environmental review. For example, consideration of establishing a reasonable range of alternatives will be different than that used in, uh, for large light water reactors. Crucial to everything I've discussed is having staff with the right critical skills to complete the work. In our case, a diverse set of technical skills are needed, including earth sciences, such as geology, seismology, and surface water hydrology. We have developed a strategy to assure that staff with these skills are available to support all of our activities on agreed upon schedules. The strategy includes working with other offices to leverage staff with the requisite critical skills. For example, the Office of Research has provided tremendous support in the areas of seismology and hydrology. In addition, we have estimated a long-term sustainable staffing level to support our hiring strategy, and we intend to use contractors to serve as surge capacity for times of heavy activity. With that, I thank you for your time and attention. I look forward to your questions, and next I'll turn it over to Laura, Vic, Victor, Rick, Justin to discuss the construction and vendor oversight program. Good morning, Chairman, Commissioners. I'm Laura Dudes. I'm the Director of the Division of Construction Inspection and Operational Program. Oh, I have the first slide, don't worry. The Construction Oversight Program has been developed over 15 or more years, taking into account lessons learned from the past, including many of the conclusions and recommendations from New Reg 1055, which is the document depicted on this slide. This is a comprehensive collection of lessons learned from construction activities conducted in the 1970s and 80s. As a result of this study, the NRC developed and codified the Part 52 regulation that resolves design and siting issues early in the licensing processes. And we have developed our inspection and oversight program with Part 52 in mind. Namely, we will verify that the plant has been built in accordance with the licensing basis. Numerous program and policy issues have been resolved through public interactions and commission decisions. The most recent being the ITAC maintenance rule, which, was, which will become effective 
uh, this week, I believe September 27th of 2012. So at this time, we have no policy issues under review for the construction oversight program, and we are in full execution mode. We have a rigorous safety focus program being implemented for the oversight of the four AP1000s under construction in the United States. Similar to our first implementation of early site permit, design certification, and combined license application applications, we do expect to learn lessons that will strengthen our construction and ICAT closure programs over time. Next slide, please. Today I want to focus on the multiple facets of the program and the organizations that are working together in the business line to implement safe and effective construction oversight, leading to a technically sound recommendation to you, the Commission, which will support the decision that the, that the facility was built in accordance with the prescribed conditions in the license and the licensees can commence operation. I'm going to move around this slide uh, in a clockwise manner, beginning with construction inspection on site, which includes inspection of safety-related systems, structures, and components, as well as inspections of the licensee's programs such as quality assurance and corrective actions. These inspections are led by Region 2 with support as needed from technical staff here in headquarters. Over the next few years, the NRC will inspect thousands of systems, structures, and components to verify safe construction of the units. As we are implementing the program, we are realizing a great benefit from having the staff that has just completed a review of the licensee safety analysis report available to assist the inspectors by either participating in the inspect inspection activities or providing technical assistance when questions are raised in the field. Moving on to assessment and enforcement, we are implementing the construction reactor oversight process, which evaluates the significance of construction inspection findings and provides for periodic assessment of the licensee's performance, which will inform our need to adjust ins inspection activities or resources in a particular area. We will conduct annual self-assessments of our oversight program and make necessary changes in a timely manner. I do want to note the collective efforts of the team, both Region 2, Office of General Counsel, Office of Enforcement, and the Office of New Reactors all provide input into the assessment and enforcement process to assure techni technically sound, consistent, and legally <coughs> defensible application of our program. Also, the Office of Enforcement updated the enforcement policy to reflect the Part 52 construction environment and our oversight program. Moving on to inspections, tests, analysis, and acceptance criteria closure verification. It is the licensee's responsibility to perform the inspections, tests, and analysis and ensure that the acceptance criteria are met. We have a robust program to verify these activities are being done in a quality manner. We do know that the licensees will be submitting the majority of the ITAC closure notifications towards the end of the construction period, and we have the procedures, processes, and information technology tools in place to assure that the NRC will be able to fulfill our mission in an effective and timely manner. In a few moments, Justin will walk you through an example of how our inspection activities uh, will feed into our ITAC closure program. Moving on to vendor inspection. In April of this year, the NRC created a center of expertise for the reactor vendor program, which now resides in the Office of New Reactors. The vendor inspection program verifies that licensees are fulfilling their regulatory obligations with respect to providing effective oversight of the supply chain. It accomplishes this through a number, activi number of activities including performing inspections to verify the effective implementation of a vendor's quality assurance program. The vendor inspection program has also assumed the lead for inspections that cover certain types of generic activities associated with ITAC closure, such as equipment qualification testing. Rick will provide some examples of those inspections and discuss some of the early results uh, in a few moments. Now, before I leave the slide, I would also re like to recognize other partners in the new reactor business line. In addition to Region 2, Regions 1, 3, and 4 have resources to support operator licensing, and the Office of the Chief Human Capital Officer's Human Resources Training and Development staff is on track to deliver the AP1000 simulator, which will help uh, train our license examiners. We are expecting a large number of initial operator exams for these four plants, and we will be prepared to license the personnel who will operate these new facilities. We're also working with our colleagues in the Office of Nuclear Security and Incident Response to assure timely development of security and emergency preparedness inspection procedures. Next slide, please. 
So as we look forward for the oversight program, we continue to pursue both international and domestic construction experience to assure timely dissemination of early lessons learned. Early challenges for licensee is, include maintaining design fidelity with a certified design in a highly dynamic construction environment, and assuring alignment and oversight with their suppliers and constructors as field modifications are implemented. We are open to enhancements to our program as a result of issues that arise during construction. However, we do need to evaluate these issues thoroughly, make sure we understand the root causes, uh, and engage in public dialogue prior to making any changes to our current regulatory process. As both Glenn and David ma mentioned, uh, the Office of New Reactors is leading an agency-wide effort to develop an integrated transition plan to assure the smooth transition of agency functions as these plants go into operation. One of the key areas within the purview of the oversight program is assuring resources for the transition are planned and budgeted to support the licensee's operational timeline. As we move into the 2015 budget development cycle, we will begin accounting for operational resources the region will need such that we can provide adequate time for hiring and training uh, the operational staff. And finally, we are engaged with the small modular reactor community to understand their design and construction models such that we identify policy issues early as it is likely that a significant portion of the safety-related fabrication activities will take place at a large-scale man manufacturing facility rather than at the final site location. So that concludes my prepared remarks. I will turn it over to Victor McCree. Thanks a lot. Uh, good morning, Chairman and Commissioners. In April 2006, our Commission Staff Requirements Memorandum created a dedicated organization in Region 2 to implement the construction inspection program. Uh, as such, Region 2 provides oversight for all reactor and fuel cycle facilities under construction in the United States. Uh, currently, this includes uh, 10 CFR Part 52 licensees, four of those, uh, one uh, 10 CFR Part 50 applicant, uh, Watts Bar, and, and several fuel cycle facilities. In order to accomplish these activities, we've hired and trained and qualified a number of construction inspectors. Uh, over 50 inspectors in Region 2 are now fully qualified um, after completing an inspection uh, qualification process that takes about two years. Uh, in addition, over 20 operator license examiners are completing cross qualifications in the AP1000 technology. I'd also note, uh, as Laura mentioned, that a small amount of uh, construction uh, resources, uh, one FTEE at each, are assigned to the other regions. Currently, the Vogel, Summer, and Watts Bar two sites each have three construction resident inspectors assigned to the sites. Uh, as Glenn mentioned, uh, the senior construction resident inspector uh, at Vogel is here today, Justin Fuller, who will be speaking shortly. Also, Rasheen Jackson, uh, the senior resident inspector at Summer, is here, and Tommy Mazzario, the senior resident inspector at Watts Bar Unit 2, are in the well and are available to answer questions. Uh, Fred Brown, my deputy uh, regional administrator for construction, is also here in the well. As work ramps up at each site, uh, we may assign additional resident, uh, construction resident inspectors at each site. Uh, next slide, please. Schedule changes such as those at Watts Bar Unit 2 are a challenge to our management of the program, but we have worked closely uh, with the program offices to maintain a flexible uh, inspection resource so that we're able to provide timely and high quality inspections uh, within a fluid environment. Uh, I should note that Watts Bar Unit 2 is covered by a customized inspection program that reflects its construction history and status. To date, uh, we've not experienced major schedule changes on the 10 CFR Part 52 plants, Vogel and Summer, uh, but if we do, we'll be, we will be prepared to deal effectively with, uh, with those changes. Uh, as you know, China is building AP1000 reactors. Uh, since they are uh, ahead of the U.S. plants, uh, we are sending and have sent our construction inspectors uh, to Sanmen, Ch China, which is one of the sites uh, currently constructing the AP1000 design uh, so that they can observe and learn. Uh, so far, we've sent uh, civil mechanical uh, welding inspectors for three months' assignments, and a week ago, uh, we sent an electrical engineer inspector. Uh, we will continue to monitor the construction activities at Sanmen and will likely send additional inspectors there to observe uh, key construction and pre-operational activities. During the visits by the first three inspectors uh, that we sent to Sandman, our inspectors tested out uh, a number of NRC inspection procedures and gathered information to improve uh, our processes. 
uh, while we observed uh, many uh, positive things, such as the high quality of the welders and their work at Sand Men, much of which is, is manual welding, uh, we did identify several lessons learned. Uh, for example, our inspectors noted that the construction schedules for the actual uh, site and vendors providing structures, systems, and components, SSCs, were constantly in a state of flux. And based on the constant changes in construction and fabrication schedules, those SSCs available for inspections were continuously moving and evolving. Uh, so in response, we, um, to ensure an, an efficient inspection planning process, we enhance our communications with the licensees, uh, the vendors, as well as the construction staff. Our inspectors also observed several areas where difficulties were uh, experienced during the installation and fabrication of some SSCs. Uh, these items were added uh, as specific inspection attributes and in NRC planning documents, which Justin will talk about here briefly, uh, to increase the focus of our inspection efforts. Next slide, please. As Laura noted, uh, New Reg 1055 identified lessons learned uh, for both the organizations building nuclear power plants as well as the uh, NRC. Uh, while licensees have addressed many of those lessons learned, some of the same issues are, are still being seen. Uh, for example, the design as you build uh, process or approach was a challenge in the construction of the current operating fleet. Uh, a related challenge today involves implementation of the design change process in conjunction with the license amendment proce process. Under 10 CFR Part 52, license amendments are required for certain types of design changes. Some of the more important uh, NRC lessons learned from the new Reg 1055 are shown on the slide, and they include inspecting early and ensuring the resident inspection force is large enough, uh, and as you implement the construction inspection program, that you compile an accurate inspection record. And finally, that you perform a good scrub of the licensee's corrective action program. As Rick and Justin will illustrate in a moment, uh, we have a solid oversight program. Uh, and we are identifying problems uh, at an appropriate threshold, and we believe they've added value. Uh, the inspections we've conducted uh, over the last couple of years have prompted licensees to take timely uh, corrective actions. They've also focused licensee attention on the need to better manage uh, the ITAC, uh, to improve the oversight of contractors, and to focus more attention on the review of changes that may affect the licensing basis. In summary, we're verifying that licensees construct the facilities according to the approved design and licensing basis using quality practices and materials. Uh, ultimately, our efforts will contribute to us determining uh, when it, whether an ITAC has been completed satisfactorily and ensure that there are no latent defects in the constructed plants. At this point, I'd like to turn it over to Rick. Well, thank you. I'm Richard Rasmussen, the Chief of the Electrical Vendor Inspection Branch in the Office of New Reactors. I'm going to briefly describe the role of vendor inspections and how they contribute to the oversight of new reactor construction. Next slide. The Division of Construction Inspection and Operational Programs has been conducting vendor inspections since the inception of the Office of New Reactors in 2007. Vendor inspections are unique because the vendors are not licensed by the NRC and the quality assurance requirements of 10 CFR 50 Appendix B do not directly apply to the vendors. The requirements are passed to the vendors through contracts by the licensees, and we require that the licensees oversee performance of the vendors. However, the requirements of 10 CFR Part 21 are directly applicable to the vendors, and these requirements are also sampled through vendor inspections. Approximately 30 vendor inspections are planned for fiscal year 2013. Next slide. Between 2007 and 2011, the focus of vendor inspections was primarily on vendors supporting license applications and on vendors producing the long lead reactor components. Inspections of engineering firms sample compliance with the attributes of Appendix B that are necessary to ensure the engineering products are developed by qualified individuals using appropriate codes, standards, and that the engineering is appropriately reviewed, controlled, and stored. Next slide. For the inspections of reactor vessels, nozzles, and other heavy components, the inspectors review work in progress to independently assess the compliance with the design codes, standards, and NRC requirements. Inspectors also sample procedures and programs to make sure the vendors have the infrastructure in place to meet NRC requirements. Beyond the NRC, the licensees, 
and the American Society of Mechanical Engineers authorize nuclear inspectors devote significant resources to the inspection of these components. Next slide. In 2012, the focus of our inspections shifted based on industry activities. We are now heavily engaged with the inspection of qualification testing, type testing, and engineering design work. Examples include design and qualification testing being performed for the AP1000 squib valves. These large squib valves are risk significant components that are unique to the AP1000 design. The squib valves use an electrically activated explosive charge to mechanically shear the valve seal and depressurize the reactor in case of an emergency situation. Other inspections include environmental qualification testing of motor actuators and containment penetrations, electromagnetic compatibility testing of electrical components, and engineering work being performed to translate the certified design into construction details. Beyond 2013, our priorities will likely shift again as the procurement activities for the new reactors move towards accumulating parts and equipment necessary to complete the construction. In this phase, many of the vendors will also be supplying goods and services for the operating reactors. Next slide. Vendors are selected for inspection using the guidance contained in the NRC Vendor Inspection Program Plan. Factors affecting our current selections are related to the complexity and uniqueness associated with the new designs. The association with ITAC is also a significant factor. The vendor inspection staff interfaces with Region 2 weekly to make sure inspection priorities are aligned, to gain insights from the regional inspectors, and to share schedule information. In addition to the vendors supporting the new reactors, the Vendor Inspections Center of Expertise also conducts vendor inspections in response to allegations and operational programs, operational events. Uh, next slide. The vendor inspectors are also the primary contributors to the agency strategy for keeping counterfeit, fraudulent, and suspect items out of the nuclear supply chain. When appropriately implemented, the requirements of 10 CFR 50 Appendix B provide a strong defense against counterfeit and fraudulent items. Vendor inspectors also review reported incidents and facilitate internal and external communications. The vendor inspection branches have a strong engagement with the international community. Through the Multinational Design Evaluation Program Vendor Inspection Cooperating Working Group, we have improved our understanding of other countries' quality assurance requirements and their inspection practices by participating in witnessed and joint inspections. Additionally, through bilateral agreements, we have sent a vendor inspector to work with the French regulator for a one-year rotation and sent another to work with the Chinese regulator for three months. These rotations have provided insights into the regulatory environments and establish professional contacts that continue to facilitate our communications and technical exchanges. Next slide. Vendor inspections result in an understanding of vendor performance and of how vendors are contributing to the systems, structures, and components, and in some cases, the ITAC that will comprise a completed facility. Inspections also result in inspection findings and other useful insights related to vendor activities, component limitations, or future inspection needs. Inspection re results are documented in inspection reports and have three possible outcomes. If we identify inspection findings, we issue notices to formally engage the vendor to take corrective action. We review the vendor's response letters and engage through docketed correspondence or follow-up inspections as necessary. In most cases, this engagement is early in the process and promotes safety by identifying issues at the earliest opportunity. In some instances, we identify issues that are not violations or nonconformances. They are best described as inspection insights that are worthy of further follow-up. In many cases, these issues should be followed up by Region 2 in the field. An example of such an issue is the cable resistance requirements for the AP1000 squib valve firing circuit. A vendor inspection team reviewed the design details during a design review inspection. Because of the safety significance of the squib valves, the team felt that the installation and testing of the cables should be inspected. 
Therefore, we are utilizing a technical assistance request to formally task the region to perform this follow-up inspection. In other instances, we identify inspection insights that would be useful to inspectors, but do not rise to the level expressed in our previous example. An example of this type of information is bounding configurations of qualification testing that in some instances could limit how a component should be installed or utilized. For these cases, we document our inspections so that the regional inspectors can use them when they're planning their inspections. And now I'll turn it over to Justin to describe the inspections at the construction site. Thanks, Rick. Good morning. My name is Justin Fuller. I'm the senior resident inspector at the Vogel Units 3 and 4 construction site in Waynesboro, Georgia. The purpose of my presentation today is to describe the processes and tools that we use, the, the inspectors, the region-based inspectors and the resident inspectors are using every day to plan, schedule, document, and manage our construction inspections. Slide 46, please. This slide shows, at a high level, what our construction inspection process looks like. My following slides will show how a specific construction activity was planned, how it was uh, scheduled, and then how it was inspected. We plan our inspections using what we call smart plans. And then I'll describe in detail how we perform the inspection and then used a database we, we call SIPMs to document the results. And SIPM stands for the Construction Inspection Program Information Management System. Slide 47, please. When planning our construction inspections, we created generic and site-specific inspection plans we refer to as smart plans. The smart plans serve several purposes, but the main goal is to provide the inspectors with more detailed information that will help them perform better inspections. Since some ITAC may take a license of years to complete, we needed to help the inspectors identify the most, op most opportune times to perform their inspections in the field. We accomplished this by linking each smart plan with, to a specific activity in the licensee's construction schedule. This slide shows one smart plan that we created for an ITAC associated with the construction of the AP-1000 containment vessel. In this example, the smart plan tells the resident inspector to inspect the installation of the fuel transfer tube insert plate. This is very helpful to the inspector because there are over 60 welds on the containment vessel bottom head alone, and we need to know which welds to focus our inspection efforts on. We've created other smart plans for this ITAC to cover activities such as the post-weld heat treatment, installation of the personnel and equipment hatches, and installation of the steam line and feed line insert plates into the containment vessel. The smart plans also provide the inspectors with an estimate of a number of hours allotted for their inspection, and also relevant construction or fabrication insights for the inspector to consider during their inspection, such as those that Rick referred to in his presentation. Next slide, please. This slide shows the example ITAC that the smart plan on the previous slide was for. This ITAC requires that pressure boundary welds and components listed in a reference table meet the applicable code requirements. The ITAC requires that the licensee perform an inspection of the pressure boundary welds, and the acceptance criteria is that the non-destructive examination is acceptable. There are over 75 components in the table listed, in the reference table listed in the ITAC. The NRC's inspection planning process reviewed all the components from that table and then selected a representative sample for inspection. The containment vessel is one component from that table and we selected it for direct inspection. Next slide, please. So once we've identified our inspection sample, the next step in the process is to schedule the inspection. Each week, Region 2 publishes a report that summarizes the upcoming inspections or the upcoming smart plan items that may be available for inspection. And that's based on the licensee's current construction schedule and feedback from the resident inspectors at the site. Although it's a little difficult to read on the slide, this, show, this slide shows one page from that weekly schedule report. The circle is around the smart plan item which we discussed on my previous slide. Each smart plan item, as I mentioned before, was linked to an activity in the licensee's construction schedule. Therefore, as the construction schedule changes, 
So does our inspection schedule, it'll adjust with it. Next slide, please. Now that we've planned, scheduled, now that we've planned and scheduled our inspections, the next step in the process is to actually perform the inspection. This is a picture of the fuel transfer tube insert plate for Vogel Unit 3. As I mentioned a moment ago, this example ITAC requires that the licensee perform an inspection of the as-built pressure boundary weld, and the acceptance criteria was that a report exists and concludes that the code requirements were met for that non-destructive examination. What I want to share with you on this slide is that our inspections cover much more than just the review of that non-destructive testing report referenced in the acceptance criteria. We perform our inspections using the guidance of the NRC's construction inspection procedures, and these procedures direct us to observe and review licensee activities, construction activities, to determine whether they were performed in accordance with all the applicable quality and technical requirements. In this case, an acceptable non-destructive examination is just one of those technical requirements. The inspectors, and, and me personally, this was an inspection I performed at the Vogel site, we observed the cutting of the containment vessel bottom head along with the fit-up and in-process welding of the insert plate. The inspectors observed the licensee's non-destructive inspection of this weld and reviewed the associated testing report. We also performed our own independent visual inspection of the weld. In doing so, we looked for cracks, porosity, undercut, and even measured the weld reinforcement using our own NRC-supplied gauges. In addition to that, we performed an independent review of the radiographic film for that weld. No findings were identified during this inspection, and the results of this inspection provide us confidence that other similar welds that we didn't target for direct inspection will meet applicable code requirements. Slide 51. Once the inspection is complete, the inspectors document the results in SIPMs, where they are also linked to the ITAC. The graphic here on this slide is simply the home screen of the SIPMs database. SIPMs is a tool that we use to record our inspection results and track the completion status of our inspection program. We will use SIPMs to generate the inspection reports that will then be entered into the agency-wide documents, access, and management system, ADAMS, as the official agency record. I also wanted to mention here that the NRC is preparing to pilot the use of tablet devices at Vogel and Summer, which should provide us the ability to more efficiently access information such as procedures, codes, specifications, and drawings directly from the field. Although we're not quite ready yet, a future vision would be that we could access SIPMs directly from those tablet devices and input our inspection results in real time. So in closing, the message that I want to leave with you today is that the inspection staff at the sites and in the regional office use these tools on a daily basis to manage our inspections. And I can say from personal experience that these tools help us complete our part of the NRC's inspection program. So on that note, I'd like to turn, that concludes my portion of the presentation. I'd like to turn it back over to Glenn to summarize the key messages. Thanks, Justin. In closing, I'd like to highlight four key messages from today's briefing. First, the staff has demonstrated its effective use of the programs and processes developed to evaluate new reactor applications. Next slide, please. The staff will be prepared to evaluate small modular reactor applications by applying its experience with the large light water reactor reviews. Next slide, please. The new reactor construction oversight program is built on lessons learned. And last, the inspection program confirms that the plant has been built in accordance with the license. With those key messages, I'd like to turn it over to Bill. Well, that completes the staff's presentation. We're ready for questions. I think what we're going to do is take a short break um, before we head to questions. So, five minutes.
think we'll get moving on the rest of everything. Um, so thank you all very much for a whole bunch of excellent presentations. Uh, and I know I have a whole lot of questions and I'm sure my colleagues do too. So I think we'll turn immediately to that and we'll turn first to Commissioner Sinecki. Thank you very much, Chairman. And uh, we have had a number of presenters. So although I usually try to direct my questions to a presenter, I think in this instance, partly because I, I won't remember who discussed what topic. <laughs> I will just uh, make my questions more general, but I do have to, to comment and uh, extend a, a welcome to Justin. It seems very recently we stood in the rain in Georgia getting our shoes very muddy. I'm sure your shoes are muddy most of the time probably, but uh, we talked about at that time there was some notion that you were gonna be asked to be here today, but you've done uh, an outstanding job in representing you and your counterparts from uh, Watts Bar and Summer. I wanna uh, thank you for that presentation and I'm very glad we got to hear directly from you. You and I were also attired ra rather differently that day. I almost, almost didn't recognize you, but uh, it, that's a good, a good fortification of the fact that, that you and your, your colleagues are doing a lot of really important hands-on work. The other quick thought I had was um, I, I met uh, your additional colleagues who are inspecting on site. So lest anyone think that things are going uninspected today at Watts Bar, Summer, and Vogel, we can assure them that that is not true. You've left that in the capable hands of your colleagues to take care of today so that the three of you can be here. Um, I, I'm gonna start out with something very general. I think that most of us that have any exposure to large um, manufacturing or construction projects, we know that when you get into the project, change is going to be a fact of life. And so as we begin this process, I don't know who best could reflect at a, you know, a fairly high level on whether or not we've struck the right balance between having very disciplined and well-documented processes and the fact that we need to accommodate change. Uh, you know, there's been mention made of license amendments uh, that we're maybe, uh, we're beginning to see perhaps more than we uh, predicted. I think at the mandatory hearings, if my memory's right, I asked the um, then applicants for Summer and Vogel if they knew already of license amendments that were going to be needed, and I think both of them indicated that they weren't aware of any at the time. So uh, do, you, do you think we've struck the right balance in our processes because not everything can be done uh, through the amendment process? And I noticed that you already have someone at the microphone willing to address that. And I'm probably the best equipped at this point, uh, although I'm sure many of us who've been involved in the oversight that's taken place up to this point in time since the license have been issued could probably answer this question. Um, at this point in time, I, I just give you a, a, by way of example, there's expected even in this calendar year to be a total of maybe 16 or 17 license amendment requests from, uh, from Southern Company with regard to the two Vogel units. Um, several of those amendment requests also have associated with them a preliminary amendment request, um, uh, which is a process we developed um, uh, prior to the licenses being issued that uh, would permit the timely resolution of issues such that we, we would make a determination uh, that, that uh, the ITAC wouldn't be interfered with and that there was no significant hazards considerations and environmental uh, reviews uh, wouldn't be disturbed such that they could continue construction while we actually evaluated the request itself for final approval. That process has been exercised two or three times already. Um, it was exercised for the, uh, the base mat membrane thickness and base mat tolerance thickness. Um, it was exercised for the uh, uh, change to use a higher PSI concrete yes. um, uh, to address concerns associated with the rebar. We think those processes are working well. Um, but these are the first application of those processes. And so we're learning as an organization, the licensees are learning. Uh, recently the licensees have requested us to consider processes that would provide them some additional flexibility associated with those conditions which are viewed as, as found or non-conforming. And we just had a meeting last week to consider some proposals by NEI that would uh, propose processes that would address some of those, uh, some of those issues um, that would allow them 
to continue construction activities while they evaluate whether or not a change to the licensing base is gonna be needed. So we're still in the process of working through those proposals, um, and, and we'd be, uh, of course, consulting with OGC in Region 2 as to whether or not we'd be in a position to endorse uh, those kind of guidance. It, and I appreciate that information. I, I know there was an emphasis in a number of the presentations today about that the entire Part 52 process was built off of lessons learned, and I, I think, though, that we, we can't have had perfect foresight about everything, so that's not a human kind of expectation. So there must continue to be areas as we, as you're mentioning, exercise some of these processes for the first time. The, the other thing is that if we were not accurate in our predictions about perhaps how frequently something would occur, a process that if you're doing five or six might be sustainable may become unsustainable if you've got many dozens of something. So I think that as we learn new information, and it sounds like we're already doing this, we just need to continue that, I think, lessons learned orientation as we move forward. Um, yeah, I think you make a good point, Commissioner, but I also don't want to lose sight of the fact that we need to stay true to the principles of Part 52. Uh, we, the Commission, approved a design based on a certain level of design information that we need to make sure remains valid or they go through the change processes, which could go all the way to a revised rulemaking if that was the necessary requirement. But there needs to be discipline. I mean, at the risk of sounding too much like a regulator, you can't let the, the process, the applicants benefit from the design finality of a design certification and then give them the flexibility to, to build it the way we built plants in the 70s. Right? There needs to be enough discipline to maintain the integrity of this new licensing and inspection process. Uh, and we'll find the right balance. I mean, we do not, under any circumstances, want to be unreasonable, but it's very important that it be done right. We shouldn't sacrifice quality or come up with a one-time process just because these are the first set of plants. It's, uh, you know, I think we really need to maintain a high level of quality from the very beginning. And, and I appreciate that. I'm, I'm glad you got that on the record. I, again, I had begun my question talking about striking a balance. I think when you're designing a process, you strike one balance, but when you're in that process, I think it's useful to continue to look at that, and, and it isn't a matter of either or. I think that it will be a, a, a process of, of balancing uh, what needs to be done here, so I appreciate your perspective on that. Bill, the, the one other thing I'll, I'll turn to quickly is the, um, I hate using things like this because they don't have much meaning to the public, but the 10 CFR 52103G finding, ultimately it's this finding that uh, things have been constructed in accordance with the discipline processes that Bill Bolcher was just discussing. Laura, you had touched on that in your presentation. And I know that, you know, years ago there was, uh, this is a complex, it sounds very, very straightforward, but it's actually complex, and Laura's kind of laughing and, and shaking her head in agreement that it is much more complicated than it appears. It, people have used this term in the past that you have to have this magic moment or magic day where a lot of things are frozen in their uh, closure and finality. And so, Laura, could you expand a little bit on the staff's thinking as we uh, approach uh, the staff recommending that that finding is ready to be made and uh, our resolution of issues and complexities that we found associated with that. Also, is there any planning for, I don't know if tabletops would be useful here, other ways to exercise the process uh, prior to actually trying to carry it out? Yeah, well, first of all, we have done tabletops okay. as part of uh, the Department of Energy ITAC uh, demonstration. So we've done that. that went all the way through to the findings? Yes. Okay, great. Yes. And we learned a lot of lessons which have helped us um, update our guidance with respect to that. So at this point, I think with the um, NEI, Nuclear Energy Institute guidance document, we have about 80% of the ITAC closure notifications or examples of them which have been established in the guidance documents. Okay. So there's two things that are gonna happen. Uh, the staff is gonna get ITAC closure notifications under 5299. And we're gonna review 100% of those closure notifications. And that's where we verify that all of the inspections, tests, and analysis have been complete. Then we're gonna go into and look at our inspection program that completed the numerous thousands of systems, structures, and components that Justin talked about that we will have inspected. 
And within the Construction Inspection Program Management Information System, SIPMS, um, we will have a body of information that's beginning today that will go all the way up until the last ITAC closure notification comes in that tells us and gives us confidence that we've inspected uh, the areas that we planned on inspecting and probably others um, that will come up over time. And then we will uh, look at that inspection record against the ITAC closure notifications and then provide a recommend to the recommendation to the commission that yes, we have reasonable assurance based on the inspections we've done, based on 100% ITAC, ITAC closure notification review that we will do here in headquarters. So th that paper will be very succinct, I hope, in terms of um, our recommendation, but with a lot of background in terms of how we came to that finding. And in fact, we are developing a paper for the commission now. I believe it will go up in November sometime, being developed under Mike Mayfield's policy group, which will talk about 103C, which is interim operations. The commission had asked about that in uh, the SRM associated with the ITEC maintenance rule. But we're gonna touch upon 103G and walk you through, okay. here's what we think that finding or our recommendation will look like at that time. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you for that answer. And Madam Chairman, depending on the questions of my colleagues, if we did a second round, I might have one more. Thank you. I was thinking a second round might be appropriate myself because I have a long list. <laughs> so let me now turn to Commissioner Maggie. Thank you, Chairman. Good morning. Good morning. Um, let me um, well, let me echo back with some of what Commissioner Savinicki led off with, with this, uh, the word she used was balance, um, what Part 52 represents. You know, I, I, had a, I had the opportunity to talk with, um, with uh, Tony and Ron uh, during the break, and you'll be happy to know that they said exactly the same thing you did, so they trained you well. <laughs> um, <laughs> But let me, let, me, let, me, let me push a little bit more on that because, you know, I, I do think that as I've, um, you know, visited the, the, uh, the construction sites, I'm going back to summer next week, next week, I think, and um, visited um, uh, Shaw Modular Construction and, and had discussions with the licensees and talked to, you know, our staff during the process, it, it's becoming clear to me that we are learning a lot about how this actually works. And I think that we've learned, um, that Part 52 is a very, and you characterize it, is, is a very prescriptive, uh, very detailed uh, process where, um, where in order to achieve an ITAC closure, you have to have built exactly what you promised to build. And um, you alluded to um, the aspect, the character of the Part 50 process being that there's always this sort of mushiness at the end. You know, you sort of fabricate it. People look at it and say, well, okay, that looks about right to us, and you kind of move forward. There, there is, there is, does seem to me to be this um, characteristic of building anything that when you get down to a certain level of detail, um, it gets hard to be absolutely sure that 10 years ago you designed, you know, a girder or you designed a part, and now you're fabricating it, and then you're on the ground you know, welding this thing or drilling holes in it, and now you say, you look at it and say, this doesn't make, this isn't the best way to build this part. We should build it this way. And the question now becomes, all right, does this now turn into a license amendment, or is this something you can do in the 5059 process? And, you know, and I wonder, you know, and I wanted just for a challenge a little bit what you said, because I, I agree with you philosophically, but from a practical standpoint, is, is it possible that there needs to be some modification how we approach um, Part 52 in, in that there, there are these very practical, uh, very low-level changes that licensees uh, may, need or may need to make in construction um, that have no impact on safety, but nevertheless are slightly different from what was anticipated. I mean, is it, I, know that, I know this is something that the staff has been thinking about, so I just want to get your thoughts about that. Okay. I'll start. Mm -hmm. Something that has no impact on safety wasn't relied on to make the decision to certify the rule or to issue the combined license. So uh, there is, uh, we don't go to that level of detail throughout the entire design of the facility. Uh, and so the, there are a lot of uh, areas where flexibility exists as long as the facility is being constructed in accordance with the reference code and standard. So 
uh, that flexibility ha does exist today and always will. Uh, what uh, the point that I was trying to make is that when changes are made, though, that impact the this, this safety review and the decision that was the basis for the commission's approval of this, either the certification rule or the combined license, that that needs to go through a change process that's, that's well laid out in Part 52. And, and that flexibility exists. Now, the, the downside, maybe I'm getting a little off on a tangent, the downside is that'll take time if we have to review it. And if we had to amend the rule, that's not something that happens instantaneously. So the licensee needs to make a decision. Is it, is it better to stick with the approved uh, design and build that even though maybe it costs more or it takes a little, uh, you know, there's a schedule impact? Or take the time to do a licensing regulatory review? But in my view, we can't compromise and play fast and loose with Part 52 because we're faced with that new reality, you know, that reality. Yeah, I agree. Philosophically, I agree with that. But I, I, do, I do think, and you know, I don't want to point to specific examples in this form, but I do think there have been, there has been at least one case that I've become aware of uh, where there was um, a fabrication issue that arose on the ground uh, during the, 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 the fabrication of a, of a part uh, where it really came down to the placement of, of essentially a bolt. You know, the case I'm, I'm thinking about. I don't think that, w I don't think there's anyone, in anyone's judgment, that was a safety issue. But there was a, unless I'm wrong, it, it, I mean, I see Vic's eyes moving. If there was a safety aspect of that, that wasn't, maybe Vic can correct me. Uh, Commissioner, I, I believe what you're referring to is the Nelson stud placement on yes, some uh, sub-modules. I was trying not to get that specific. <laughs> I understand. And I, uh, the issue was that the, we, the licensee had, <coughs> the uh, vendor and uh, had not uh, analyzed that issue per the, the change process and, uh, and did not identify. We, we identified the issue um, and the resolution of that is, is, still, is still incomplete and that's not. Right, that's which not is what I was trying not to get into it. Right. But, but again, I, uh, but well, since we now have identified that issue, let me sort of stop the conversation there. I'll, I'll talk to you about this more offline. But, I, I, but as, long as, as long as we are talking about changes that can be made that where there are no safety impacts and the licensees are, can proceed to make those changes and Glenn, you're nodding. I, I, don't, I don't see this as a, as a big problem. But if there are issues where we have, because of the way the, the, the ITACs are constructed, um, have gotten down to, to a level, low level detail, are we able to identify those and make those corrections? I believe that <coughs> Dave Matthews and other members of the staff and the inspectors have been able to have those types of discussions with uh, those that we regulate to have them understand the dividing line, sir, between what is uh, going to be affected and what is not affected. And I think that that's getting more clear uh, every day as we implement the process. I agree with the principles, obviously, that we're all agreeing to that Bill has stated. We're trying to stay open-minded to what is it being experienced because changes and non-conformances are going to occur. There's no denying that. So as a result, the devil is in the details, which is what Dave has uh, mentioned is going on now. The time constraints that should be potentially applied. The fact that the license C has to be fully accountable for these design control changes and fully aware that it's not some vendor somewhere making some bolt discussions without having full cognizance of the licensee in terms of that design control. Uh, the fact that Justin has to have the ability to inspect to something and know where he stands the day he's inspecting to it. These are the details that need to be further elaborated on if anyone is to have an open mind for further flexibility. Uh, Dave, did you want to add anything? I don't think I can add any more to that. <laughs> you taught me well, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see, uh, let me, um, it's probably dangerous to get into two, let, let me ask, let me ask a, a question on this. Um, we had a long, uh, I'll direct this at Vic, uh, but, we had a, a conversation in the commission, I think it's about a year and a half ago, about how to pursue security. Um, and I know, um, you know, Inser is also represented here today. How, how to look at security at construction sites. And the commission made a decision to uh, use essentially a, an industry um, established uh, uh, process. 
How is that going? Is that working? Have we found any issues with that at this point? Um, thank you for the question, Commissioner. It, it is going well. Uh, the um, uh, industry guidance you're referring to is uh, NEI, Nuclear Ener uh, Energy Institute uh, 0901. Uh, we've not identified any findings uh, associated uh, with that, uh, which, is, which is good. Um, I, I would note that the, uh, uh, based on a recent visit actually um, uh, with the Deputy for Nuclear Security Incident Response, Mark Dupa and Fred Brown, they actually talked about the licensees programs and procedures to transition from a construction to an operational en environment for security. Uh, access controls and physical security, and uh, they're, they're developing that, that's, that's ongoing. Uh, we have our procedures uh, already developed, and we're working on a schedule to implement that, uh, but thus far we haven't identified any issues uh, associated with the implementation of any IO 901. Okay, fantastic. And, and just, just to be clear, it, it's not simply that they're implementing it correct, implementing that, that guidance correctly, it's that we've, we have confidence that it's working and that, um, security at the sites is being maintained appropriately. That's correct. Okay. Yes. Excellent. All right. Thank you. Okay. And Commissioner Osterdorf. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you all for your presentations today. Uh, Bill, I want to continue to add my uh, strong support for the business line approach to these meetings. I think it really helps us to see not just what's going on in NRO, but the interfaces across the entire agency. I think it gives us a more uh, holistic view of the entire uh, NRC staff's contributions in various areas. So I, I really applaud the, this approach to uh, commission meetings. I had a chance uh, about four or five months ago to ask Laura Dude some hard questions on construction inspection back in April and May, and uh, I was a little bit of a skeptic on some of the uh, I thought the resources were that were being brought to bear for a new construction inspection down at Vogel in summer. I had done inspections uh, in 1980, 82, in 1987 to 88, uh, new construction submarines being built in new, Newport News shipyards. I had done a lim lim limited inspection of nuclear component and system testing and, and those prior experiences. So I had a little bit of a show me kind of approach to it. and. Uh, when I visited summer July 12th and 13th and Vogel, I guess the dates may be flipped, uh, I can't help but comment on how impressed I was with the team that Glenn and Laura and Victor have assembled on site at those two locations. And I'm going to maybe use this as an opportunity to comment uh, on how impressed I was and how wrong I had been about the uh, readiness of our team to take on these construction inspection tasks in a very fulsome manner. I know Justin, that he won't, nobody, nobody said this, but he has a degree in metallurgy, which impressed the heck out of me. He's qualified to read radiographic film results. And uh, Rasheen back there and uh, seeing his experience in the private sector before coming to NRC in construction areas. And Tommy, who I've seen on two different visits to watch bar with his 10 years in the agency, uh, just using these three individuals that happen to be here, but are really great representatives of the NRC staff and how competent a team you guys have, have assembled. And so my hat's off to you for that. So thanks for bringing me here to the table today to give us a chance to see them face to face. I think it's really important. Victor, that said, uh, let me ask you a question uh, with respect to the uh, <laughs> resources. And I think you said that you, between your presentation, Lars, that you had the ability and the flexibility to perhaps add additional resources where appropriate based on situational dependent circumstances. Uh, do you need anything further from the commission at this, this stage as far as resources or any budgetary approval? Uh, Commissioner, thank you for the question. I'd also add regarding your observations regarding the seniors that they also clean up very well. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, Commissioner, we're, we're very well resourced uh, and supported uh, by the program offices uh, in uh, our oversight uh, of uh, all the new uh, construction, uh, particularly at these sites. Uh, as I indicated, we have three resident inspectors at each site. We have the capacity uh, and the plan actually to uh, increase those numbers as the workload in 
increases at each of the three sites. We have at least one civil engineer, you alluded to the metallurgical background, University of Utah, he's a Ute, by the way, at, uh, at Vogel, uh, but very capable uh, resources, both at the, at the sites, back in the region, regional office. Uh, there's expertise uh, that Glenn has in his office that we call upon routinely uh, as matters arise using the TAR process or just dialogue consultation given their knowledge of the design. So I, I believe we're, we're positioned very well uh, right now and in the future to, uh, to conduct the inspections that, that we, we plan to do. Okay, well, thank you. Sure. Laura, I think this question's for you, but I'll, if you want to pass it off to somebody else, it's obviously, I want to encourage you to do that. I want to get into the modular construction inspection. And, uh, you know, any, any high level lessons that we've learned so far in the experience today, uh, down in Lake Charles or elsewhere, about what to look at and what are we seeing in the modular construction area? Yeah, I, I think, well, first of all, we've, we've, we're very early on in the process, and what we've looked at at, at Shaw Modular or some of the other vendors is really early fabric fabrication activities. When we talk about modular construction for these reactors, we really look down towards the, the full assembly on site of the in the modular assembly building. Um, we've seen some quality issues and we've seen some issues associated with uh, the design requirements and engineering requirements being translated accurately into the facilities. But it's early on, we're, we're inspecting, we're focused on that, and then as these things come onto the site and we do the full, um, full modular where they, they lay the, fit up the walls and they start putting the components and piping and, and fit ups in there. We'll, we'll keep the early issues, the fabrication and quality issues in mind and then continue to inspect at the level we have uh, when they're doing the, the broader modular construction. I don't know if someone wants to add to that or if that's... Okay. Yeah. Okay. Rick, let me shift to you for a minute here. Kind of staying in the same theme area on the vendor inspection. Sure. A piece. Uh, I had a chance to participate in y'all's workshop back in June up in Baltimore and uh, was really impressed with the very s significant turnout you had, uh, probably 500 or so people there the day I was there. Um, what are some of the key takeaways you're seeing or lessons learned to date in the, on the vendor side of the house and, and what challenges, if any, do you see as a concern to you? Well, we see challenges through our inspections and, and we got a lot of feedback at that workshop and those are very, very helpful for us. But uh, a lot of issues still continue with part 21 and it highlights the importance of that rulemaking and, and how we need to uh, just make it easier for the vendors to understand their requirements for, for evaluating issues and then reporting if they find a safety concern. Um, the arena of commercial grade dedication, and this applies to both mechanical components and then the new frontier, which is digital and software. And, and those two areas, we picked up a lot in the workshop with regard to the various opinions that people have, how much is enough. Um, I think we're still a ways out. We're working through developing some agency guidance. But those, I think, are the areas that we learned the most about. Do you have any concerns, uh, Bill, do you want to get ready to punch your button there? Well, yeah, well, I was just going to add from the international perspective, um, I think one of the things uh, regarding vendors is the importance of licensee oversight and ownership of vendor activities. The places around the world where we're seeing problems is where they're not as closely tied and don't display the responsibilities that they have for making sure that what they're being provided meets quality standards. Right? Can't be a turnkey. It's not as simple as writing up a contract and then taking whatever comes into the loading dock. And uh, I think that is the broadest lesson learned that I'm getting from overseas. You can apply this to other areas, but especially in the vendor area. Is it your sense, and whoever wants to take this on, please do so, but is it your sense that the licensees have the human ex capital expertise in order to provide that effective oversight? Well, uh, go ahead. Feel free. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I, 
that they're expected to, and, and they should. I mean, I think if you look at what the NRC does and how we apply our resources, if they're writing a contract for these vendors and, and suppliers, they need to be able to expend some level of resource for oversight, as well as to leverage other entities, uh, including NUPIC, um, which is a nuclear procurement issues group. So, Right. I, I would say it's a mixed bag, Commissioner. The, the um, heavy components overseas, the licensees have actually devoted quite a few resources, either a full-time dedicated person or people that travel on rotations, so they're familiar with the concept or with the, the project and see it routinely. I think those are good examples. I think other examples, some of the testing work that we've seen and, and things that go a couple layers down the supply chain is where the real problems are and, and it could be tied to resources. One, one follow-up to that, just, I know I saw this in the Naval Nuclear Propulsion Program back at the end of the Cold War, where a lot of the vendors that had provided different components, valves, pumps, et cetera, decided it was no longer economically feasible to stay in that business line. Mm -hmm. And so in the mid-1990s, you saw people exiting that market to provide naval reactors to certain parts. Do you have any concerns on the lack of competition or lack of market uh, suppliers? Um, from where you sit? We do. Um, we, of course, have those concerns, and then there's concerns with, with people that are trying to balance those costs by doing their own commercial grade dedication work and the problems that they run into um, adequately dedicating things that they don't have the design rights for. And so those are challenges. Okay. The industry is aware of these challenges. I've spoken directly, as I know Victor has, with the um, senior executives of the licensees, and they uh, are seeing a ramp up of uh, the awareness and the needs and the expectations and the requirements uh, in that area. But I think that the uh, comments that you've heard, especially when Bill did his overview, that message is one of our key messages that we're stating to these executives, and that is that you have to have this direct licensee oversight of these vendors, especially when it comes down to qualification testing and design verification testing, because that ties directly to ITAC, and they are the ones who are going to confirm that the ITAC have been closed. And That's it's that simple helpful. equation. That's very helpful. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Chairman. Okay. Um, like I said, I have a stack here. We'll see how far I get until the next round. Um, so thanks a lot, and thank, thank you guys for coming up. Um, to, to headquarters here and, and spending the time with us today. We really appreciate it. Um, all right, let's start off at the beginning or the end, as depending on how you look at it. So this is probably going to be from Mike or Scott um, or Glenn. Um, so you know all that I'm interested in the back end of the fuel cycle. <laughs> and so I'm curious as to how much thinking has gone into the back end um, as you're going through the um, design certifications and, and, and planning for things. So I'm interested in um, what has been done and is, is being thought through in terms of management of spent fuel on site, in terms of the pool design and the density of the pool and dry casks. And you know, I know there have been issues at some reactors now about transferring dry cast, you know, are, you, are the right cranes in place? You know, some of these reactors have to be modified to move the spent fuel and move the casks to other parts. I mean, is, so is this getting the attention that it should? That's question one. Well, I, uh, I'll, I'll speak to the, on, the prior and ongoing reviews with regard to large light water reactors and safety issues surrounding the management of spent fuel, its relocation, uh, the fuel transfer pools, and in fact, I think one of the drawings you saw was the fuel transfer hatch associated with the, one right. of the large light water reactors. Um, those processes, including issues associated with the capacity of the, of the cranes, the uh, protection of the pool from leakage, uh, issues recently focused on in the Fukushima lessons learned associated with spent fuel pool instrumentation. A tier two item is spent fuel pool makeup capability beyond design basis events. Um, that's integral to what the safety review for the large light water reactor addresses. So mm -hmm. um, the, the issue associated with um, uh, uh, 
uh, size of the pool, pools and the subsequent potential relocation to dry cast storage is yet another licensing decision to be made. So at the time that we license these plants, we license them for the capability of storage, um, uh, but if they have the need for additional storage, then they have to address that in the context of an additional licensing action. Okay, and so in terms of the sizing of the spent fuel pools, is this, is it different, substantially different from the current suite of reactors? No. Because one would think that it might be because, you know, the original suite of reactors were designed with the idea that the spent fuel would be reprocessed and taken off site pretty quickly and all of that. Which has driven them to consider, as you well know, multiple license requests and use of the general license for dry cast storage. These newer reactors will probably be faced with the same challenges. So why wasn't this addressed more? Yeah, uh, you know. It's not an issue of safety in terms of their capacity. It's an issue related to their willingness to design a pool sufficient to accommodate all of the fuel that might be generated for the 60 year life of that plant. Okay. Um, well, I'll well that, that was with regard to large more. light water reactors. <laughs> I don't know whether Mr. Mayfield wants to address the small modular reactor situation. Sure. Chairman, one of the things that we mentioned in the presentation is we've been doing lessons learned and we've been mm -hmm. urging the vendors to do lessons learned. Pool size is one of the lessons that they have been talking to us about pretty much since they first came in the door. Uh, we've also been talking with the industry about different fuel, uh, all but one of the four small PWR vendors is talking about half, essentially half height fuel. Doesn't, doesn't fit conveniently in the dry casks. They're gonna have to do something, whether that's design new casks and get them certified. So we've been pushing them. In fact, a year ago, I guess, uh, is Kathy hanging? Yeah, yeah, she's still back there. She went to a utility working uh, conference in Florida and made a point about why should SMR vendors be thinking about the fuel cycle and particularly the back end. And she made some points about how long it takes the certified new cask designs, what all's involved in that. And it was kind of interesting when she started the presentation, yeah, why, you know, she just won a trip to Florida. She got about two slides in and the pins came out. And it turned out to be one of the best presentations with the most follow-up questions we've had. So we've gotten their attention, they, the industry. Uh, what they actually do with it remains to be seen. They haven't submitted specific designs yet, but we certainly have motivated the conversation. So we'll, we'll stay tuned and see. Okay, good. Uh, the back end is important. Anyway, I think so. <laughs> okay, uh, Dave, back to you. So you talked about, um, you, you're now thinking about this request from merchant plants or a merchant plant in particular. Uh, and so uh, um, I'm interested in what the downside would be for the NRC of changing the requirement to demonstrate adequate funds you know, if they don't end up actually being able to finance a new build, I mean, I'm trying to understand what the, what the downside is. Well, let me first start out just with a little background that the, the changing economic marketplace and the emergence of merchants plants presents a departure from the circumstances that we faced licensing the prior 104 and even the additional four licenses we just granted in that they were for all intents and purposes, vertically integrated monopolies that, that uh, had the ability to get a rate of return from public utility commissions approved through their, their rate payers. Um, we have uh, several, um, and they're not all the same, so when you use the term merchant plant, you haven't got a single definition for merchant plant because of the degrees of regulation that vary from state to state to state. Right. So to the extent that a merchant plant um, has a significant portion of its, of its proposed output that will be in effect uh, uh, put on the open market in a wholesale generation environment. Um, it raises that question in direct contrast to our previously established processes for ensuring safety by, from one aspect, by ensuring sufficient funds for construction and operation. And our regulations are structured right now to, to uh, 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 
have the staff and the center of expertise in this area is the Office of Nuclear Reactor Regulation, is to have the staff make an evalu that evaluation that based on their project financing and business plan, that there is a reasonable assurance that they'll be able to obtain the funds for both those activities. Um, that is the regulatory framework we have in place and this changing marketplace and the advent of market generation requests for applications, um, in effect, um, although we might have been able to anticipate it when we revised Part uh, 52 in 2007, we didn't. And we did not go back into those portions of Part 50 which caused this reasonable assurance finding to be made. Okay, so that, I, I hate to put all that context around a simple mm -hmm. question. Um, um, whether there's a, quote, downside to alleviating uh, an applicant from providing that kind of reasonable assurance, given that they likely would not go forward with a project as a, in a merchant environment if they couldn't ensure the funding uh, for both safe op construction and operation, there may not be a, quote, downside in that we could put restraints and constraints on them to ensure that before they started or turned the first shovel full, that they had a, uh, uh, a commitment to us that they wouldn't do that in the absence of a project financing circumstance and a business plan mm -hmm. that would result in the success of their project. So there may not be a downside to doing that, but the challenge right now is that our regulations are based on a different model. Okay, great. Um, all right, before I get into another question, let me just, I'll stop and I'll turn back to Christy. I'll try to be brief. I just wanted to hit a couple of other topics. Glenn, you started out uh, defining the um, Office of New Reactor Goals and you stepped through those. Is it appropriate for me to assume that if uh, the agency were uh, hit with uh, any kind of sequestration, so I'm talking at a philosophical level, would your proposal be that, NR uh, that NRO work to preserve and sustain its activities based on the prioritization that you laid out in your goals? And again, I'm just talking about, do your goals then philosophically represent somewhat of a prioritization of where activities need to be sustained? They do philosophically uh, uh, give that prioritization. Um, the staff often seeks uh, at the various divisions from their directors uh, priorities on a day-to-day -day or week-to-week -week basis in terms okay. of things that arise. And so, as an example, uh, should Victor or Justin need some specific action taken for a licensing action at the construction site to ensure the safe construction of that site, there is a prioritization of addressing that issue compared to what might be on the desks of the engineer on the 10th floor. I've explained that to applicants who have come to visit me and they do understand these concepts. Well, so and I, I think even as uh, the agency, uh, again, previous commissions had to look at how NRC might prioritize if it was faced with a large number of applications, which ultimately, with the passage of the Energy Policy Act of 2005 and the incentives there, we were faced with that. There needed to be some sort of publicly communicated framework uh, so that people would know that, you know, not everything can have the same level of priority. So, I, I, you know, I commend you for that. I, I know in our first meeting when you took uh, your new responsibilities, you stepped through that. And so I, I think it's helpful just because whether or not people might agree with the priority, they know what it is. And that's, I think, our first obligation is to be very public and be communicating that if we're faced with making decisions on prioritization, we're communicating to the world that that's what we're going to do. So um, the other question that I might ask on this, that um, stepping way back, one hears uh, statements from the industry, uh, I haven't heard it lately, but I'm sure I've heard it within the last year, that depending on, you know, the energy landscape, largely low natural gas prices, that there is at least a scenario where the four, the four plants, and I get corrected on this, so Watts Bar as well, but the, the four new reactors under construction and then the, the Watts Bar site, the phrase people use is that might be it for a while, meaning that once these constructions move forward, uh, there may be some period of time where there would not be such active construction of new nuclear reactors in the United States. If that scenario were to unfold, is it, would the NRC then essentially be overstaffed? Some of the presentations this morning talked about the fact that we have 
uh, been hiring up for construction oversight. I'm wondering, maybe embedded in this question is, are the expertise, Victor talked about a two-year training and qualification program, could the individuals who are qualified for construction inspection or vendor inspect in inspections, Inherent in that is a lot of nuclear reactor understanding. Could those individuals potentially also be um, employed fully in, in uh, you know, or as resident inspectors and other things at operating sites? And then also, as the construction of the units that are underway now, we would also, in theory, by our own programmatic plans, have completed some of the COL reviews and other things. So might we reach a point where, if there is this gap, uh, we would suddenly have a real surplus of uh, NRC employees in certain areas that weren't active anymore. Right. And Commissioner, I thank you for your question. I'll try to address it from an inspection and oversight uh, perspective. As I alluded to in my opening, we're <coughs> Region 2 has a responsibility for both uh, a new reactor and new fuel cycle facility construction, and the uh, resources, the budget uh, that we've been provided provides uh, uh, the capability to do both, if you would. Based on the schedules for not only the, uh, the four AP1000s and Watts Bar, um, but also the fuel cycle facilities under construction, which there are six across the country, uh, we anticipate uh, being involved in construction inspection and oversight through at least the end of this decade on just those facilities alone. So we will need to have some uh, capability to do that. Um, and, uh, and in addition, in, in the staffing of um, uh, in our construction um, organization in Region 2, we've uh, been fortunate <coughs> to hire individuals who, uh, quite frankly, do have fungibility, uh, both as construction inspectors as well as operational inspectors. So over time, um, one of the challenges that Fred and I have is to build that transition plan so that as the construction workload um, declines and the operational workload increases, that we have uh, both the numbers as well as the, the quality, the, capable, uh, the capability to uh, to meet that out, so I, I don't envision. And that was that was really the core of, of my question was, as we do year to year planning, are we thinking about different scenarios that might occur? Yeah. And it sounds like we are. So thank you for that. I, that's really what I was looking for at bottom. And then, Victor, the other question is, um, of course, if you're going to operate a reactor, you have to have a, a populated roster of licensed reactor operators. So can you talk about? Of course, we license NRC licenses them. So uh, we'll have, uh, you know, I guess at least a mini surge, Vogel and Summer, in a in a fairly concentrated period of time, will be needing to have NRC address their need to get people through exams and, and license. Can you talk about how we're preparing for that little mini surge? Yes, thank you for the question. We <coughs> have been preparing, and we have a plan that we're executing now to uh, to hire, to train, to qualify uh, operator licensing. Uh, licensing examiners, uh, both, in, both in Region 2 uh, and, in fact, in the other three regions, as well as in, uh, here in, in headquarters and uh, in NRR, uh, to be able to handle the operator licensing workload that we anticipate. Uh, one of the challenges uh, that we are aware of has to do with the delivery of the full scope uh, simulator for the AP1000 and some uncertainty about uh, when that might happen. Um, and if there is a change or a delay in that, we may need to uh, qualify or use a, a larger pool of examiners um, than we had initially envisioned. Uh, but we have the capacity to do that. In fact, uh, we, in Region 2, we plan to uh, qualify all of the operator licensing examiners in Region 2 to cross-qualify them in AP1000 and have already reached out to the other regions again and NRR to, as well as the Technical Training Center because we have a number of uh, 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 former examiners. Actually, they're fully qualified there as well. So we anticipate being able to handle the surge. Um, uh, but we need to still communicate well, uh, not just with um, uh, Vogel and Summer about their schedules, but also with uh, the other um, operating uh, licensees in Region 2, because we'll have to sustain that workload as well. Okay, thank you. That's very helpful. Thank you, Chairman. Okay, Commissioner Magwood. Thank you, Chairman. Um, let me just start off taking another run at Borchard. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we, we've, um, we heard the, in the presentation on the um, NRR program that 
there, there is some anticipation that there are future technologies, at least we're keeping staff cognizant of the things that might come down the road, but we are also, uh, we've, we've done work in gas reactor technologies. We've, we have some small modular reactors that are beyond the, the light water that we're aware of. And we also have had some interesting technologies um, presented to the agency, uh, or I think will be presented to the agency for uh, medical isotope reduction. Uh, we've been forced to rely on Part 50 and Part 52 for all those technologies so far. Is that it? Is that what we should, should we stand pat on those two device, those two tools? Is that where we should be thinking for the long-term future, Part 50 and Part 52, and that's where it sits forever? Well, nothing's forever. I think if we learn some lessons out of this Part 52 process that uh, it would be appropriate to come up with a new rule or revise Part 52. I mean, there's, there's certainly uh, no assumption that this is perfect. Uh, so we're obviously going to learn some lessons. I think any applicant that we, uh, application that we see down, coming down the path, we could use either Part 50 or Part 52 and using the variety of tools that we have available to us uh, do a meaningful and appropriate review. High temperature gas reactors would require changes or amendments or we would have to deal with it somehow in legal space, but we could get through the process without coming up with a new part. I know the agency um, several years ago looked at developing a, I think the term was uh, technology independent risk informed process and eventually that just apparently it bogged down, became very, very complicated. Um, was there any lesson from that that now that we've gone through um, part 52 to this degree that you want to? Yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, I mean, I think it was going to be a difficult task, and I might ask Mike Mayfield if he yeah, has so he some, like he's about to leave some background. But, uh, you know, we've, the Commissioner Savinicki raised a bunch of budget related questions, and given the priority on current licensees, right, we can't sacrifice that under any circumstances. And then the desire, well, the need to, to for the current construction facilities to stay up to speed because you can't delay ITAC verification, right? You have to be there to witness certain activities. Then that really reduces the flexibility that we have to do some of this work that we know ought to be done, we would like to do, but we just don't have the resources to do it. And that rulemaking that you're talking about falls into that in my, in my judgment that well, the uh, technology neutral licensing framework and was going to go into the infamous part 53. Um, as NGNP, the next generation nuclear plant project was moving forward, commission had directed us to take that technology neutral framework out and test it on the NGNP plant that, that or design that was ultimately submitted. We were working towards that. Uh, we. In the interim, uh, with the delays in, in GNP moving forward, we were and are looking to try some of the concepts uh, from the technology neutral structure on just the small PWRs to see what works, what doesn't. Uh, how that's actually going to play out is something that uh, Charlie Ader and his staff are working with counterparts in research to line out exactly what that project's going to look like on what pace. It hinges largely on the willingness of the vendors to engage, and at least one of the vendors has told us they would like to be the pilot. So that's, that's a limited test of that technology neutral approach. As DOE has backed away from licensing the next generate the licensing phase of the next generation nuclear plant, we frankly don't have anything to test the framework against. Last week, as recently as last week, uh, we met with John Kelly and some of his colleagues at DOE talking about ways to move forward some technology neutral concepts on the, just the general design criteria and start small and let that grow if it gets some traction and with the, the DOE and with the industry, let that grow into something that could become part 50X uh, to, to address different technologies. But right now, there's not a lot more you can do absent some specific designs uh, that, that actually go beyond where folks were with high temperature gas and, and get into some specifics of the design, 
specifics that we can test that framework against. Thank you. Uh, why don't you stand up from there? I have a question I think you're probably best equipped to, to address. The, um, you know, as, we, as we've, we, I, I thought it was really useful to hear um, Glenn's prioritization, um, as Commissioner Savinicki highlighted in, in her, her questions. These, um, the technologies that we um, focus on, largely it seems to me are led by one of two things. Either we know applications are coming in and we want to be ready for them, um, or there is some significant DOE initiative to do something and we're reacting to that. And I, I think that if you look at the history of those, um, those indicators over the last 20 years, it's kind of a crap shot, quite frankly. I mean, sometimes these applications come in, sometimes they don't. Sometimes DOE follows through, sometimes it doesn't. Um, has NRC ever really had an independent process to prognosticate where it should be putting its attention in terms of future technologies? We've, we've done that a few times, and Kathy Gibson from research may be in the best position to answer, but, but research has had those kind of initiatives over time. Um, they, they, by and large, predate NRO. Uh, if some of you may know, I, I've got 20 years in the Office of Research before I managed to, to get into licensing, so I have some history on this, dating back, sir, to when you were at DOE. So we've had random starts on this. The difficulty is budget constraints come in every time and thwart some, some good thinking that goes to it. I think research in the last three or four years had an initiative looking at long range uh, activities to, to be uh, undertaken. Um, how that will structure us going forward, I think you still need to look at what technologies are being developed in the research community uh, rather than us. We're, we're not promoters, uh, as you certainly know. Uh, so you've got to look at what's coming out of the research community and then what do we need to do to be positioned to address those as they come forward to licensing. The, the time horizon for these new technologies, molten salt, 20, 25 years, it's difficult to sustain a, a a developmental activity for regulation for something that, that that's that far out. Well, one technology that's is still some distance away, but we know there's some active work on is TerraPower. We've, we've heard a lot about that. In fact, I, I saw an article in the press where some representative of TerraPower indicated that there were conversations taking place with NRC. And I think we ran at the ground and discovered that wasn't really quite we, we were keenly interested in just who that was. Yeah, it wasn't me. <laughs> I was going to blame Kathy, but. Uh. Well, has, have you looked into TerraPower? What, what's, what's, what's the status you were thinking on that as far as NRC's activities? Well, we, we were part of one of their overview presentations when they were going through the Part 810 application process. Uh, we have subsequently seen presentations from them in some technical conferences, but they haven't brought anything specifically to us uh, that basic technology is something staff understands, uh, but then you get into the specific implementation and we, we're, we're just going to have to wait and see what they bring us and on what kind of schedule to see what we can do with it. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, one, one last thing. I just wanted to um, echo um, the chairman's comments about the spent fuel. I think that um, as I recall, uh, Glenn, help me out, I think that the, uh, the current, the AP1000 plants have 20 year, I think, capacity pools, I think that's right. Um, and um, it was interesting because earlier in the design process, I, I think they were aiming at, at 40 year and they, they cut that back. Uh, but when I was listening to the chairman asking about this, I was thinking, and I won't speak for you, but I was thinking you were probably thinking, well, why weren't they planning for longer storage? Um, it may actually, especially after Fukushima, it may actually turn out that they had, they're going smaller makes more sense as opposed to going larger because you may want to get the spent fuel out of the pools faster. Um, so it, 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 it's an evolving situation. And, I, and even right now, I can't sit here today and say what the right answer is because it's something we'll be talking about uh, soon. But one, one, one thing that does raise for me is, um, you know, and with 12 seconds left, I don't want to get to a lot of this, but. It does make me wonder what um, our responsibilities are in terms of, I heard someone say that it's not a safety issue how big the pools are. Well, you know, it is and it isn't. You know, I mean, is there, is there a point where 
NRC would um, make it a design requirement uh, to, to have pools of a certain size and characteristic as opposed to simply reacting to um, a particular application. Uh, that's not typically the way NRC uh, licenses, but I, I think it's something probably staff should give some thought to. Understood. All right. Thank you, Chairman. Okay, Commissioner Ostendorf. Thank you, Chairman. I want to go back to a question that Chairman McFarland asked in the, the first round uh, on the financial qualifications for merchant plants. And I appreciate the staff bringing that up as a potential policy issue. And I was not surprised by anything Dave said, and you know, here's how we've historically looked at this. Uh, and I think your answer was spot on. I would just, you know, and I can't direct here, I'm not going to, but uh, I think it's important for us as an independent regulatory agency to be willing to evolve and consider the dynamic changes in the marketplace. If one looks in the last 20 or 30 years, what's happened with the breakup of AT&T and the whole advent of the cell phone industry, if look, you look at the uh, FCC regulation of broadband space, you look at uh, in the Federal Trade Commission, International Trade Commission, they have all taken significant changes in their approach to different issues with respect to uh, how the globalization of the economies have changed their domain of what they regulate. And so while I understand Dave's answer about the current regulatory framework for the NRC uh, has certain uh, constraints and constrictions on financial qualifications, I just hope that we are able to take a look at the fact that this is a dynamic economy, it evolves, and that a static approach uh, may not be the appropriate one. So I'm not trying to say that to advocate for a position, but I just hope that we're able to separate out the question of what our current regulations allow and what potential policy issues may be appropriate to come to the Commission to evaluate changes to our existing framework. <coughs> Bill, if you have anything you want to say or... Uh, well, o to only that the uh, licensee that did submit this uh, this letter to us did it because of some informal discussions we'd had with them, that they'd identified a, an issue. Uh, I think it's important that the industry present an argument for their position. We were certainly open to considering that, and we recognize it as a significant policy issue, and that's why we raised it today and why we asked for this input. I think the industry is in a far better position to understand the implications of the deregulated marketplace, uh, but the uh, the uh, ownership and operation of a nuclear facility is a long-term commitment, and we need to make sure that there are uh, sufficient financial resources to carry out those responsibilities. But we're wide open as to what the right answer is at this point, and are looking forward to engaging uh, the licensees. No, I appreciate it. I, I commend you, you and your team for bringing that to the Commission today in the meeting. I think it's helpful for us to have a heads up on issues that might, we might see in the future. Uh, I, I want to turn back to, uh, you didn't call them the, the wise elders, but the, uh, the Ron and Tony team here. And I, I did note, and I think Commissioner Magwood noted that uh, he had a discussion at the break. I want to comment that at the very first, uh, when you introduced these, uh, and you said that Tony had uh, failed in trying to train you, Tony nodded his head. <laughs> so using this corporate expertise that we have, uh, we're very fortunate to have with these two, two gentlemen. Uh, a question I have, and whoever wants to take it, take it, but you know, if you go back 30, or 30 years or so and you see what mistakes were being made in the last round of nuclear construction projects in this country, and you fast forward to 2012, I guess, from this corporate history perspective, are there any surprises as to where we are today based on the failure to learn lessons in the past, or are there any things that have really caught people's attention about not capitalizing on lessons learned from 30 years ago? Everyone's looking at me, and I know um, I happen to uh, take over for uh, Mr. Tracy. Uh, so as we're going through the early uh, implementation of the construction inspection program and we're talking about some of the findings, he says, I told him. I told him in 2006, I told him in 2007, I had the poster up. So he, he's, he's been, I, I think, um, I think Glenn is, uh, when he was in my job, he did make every effort to communicate uh, New Reg 1055 and, and those lessons learned. And, and whether we're surprised or not, um, 
I don't know. I think we're, we're very early on. I think Victor had mentioned um, that we are trying to make the most of these early inspection findings and drive home the key messages in terms of um, oversight of contractors, making sure you have the design uh, completed, that you understand that you're translating the design into construction drawings and, and that you're doing the, the necessary engineering reviews when you're doing that. I know there was a discussion before about change process and, and you know small changes versus large changes. We haven't seen to date um, too many examples where um, a, a high quality engineering review was done and the NRC still took issue with it. I mean that you can do those engineering reviews and have make lots of changes. If, if a portion of the certified design where there's a lot of restriction is small compared to the other information. So um, I think the short answer to your question is that I don't, you know, surprised, no, but we're working through the issues and, and we're um, very diligent in early communication of issues and trying to drive home these uh, inspection findings so that the licensees will take responsibility. Okay. Very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Okay. Um, all right. Let me try to go as quickly as I can. So I don't know who wants to handle this question, but it's sort of in the line of the previous one about uh, spent fuel pools. So thinking about fire protection, um, I'm interested in what thinking has gone in um, in the area of fire protection in, for new plants. Uh, you know, how are we applying the lessons learned from the sort of previous and still current situation to do with fire protection with new plants? Yeah, and Charles Ader, for the record. Uh, we learned from the history from the PRAs that were done on fire protection. The commission put in place enhanced fire protection requirements so we have wide separation uh, we assume an entire fire area is lost. No operator action. Okay. All right. So we have been doing lessons learned incorporation. Yeah. Good. Good. Okay. Next question. I'm sorry, Chairman. Yeah, just, yeah. just to make sure everybody understands, you know, a lot of the problems on fire protection that we spent so much time talking about were because we established a regulation after the plant had been built. That's not the case here. They, there was very great clarity as to what the regulatory requirements were. It's very easy to design a plant to meet those if you do it in that order. Right. So I think we, you won't see the uh, same kind of problems that we have with Appendix R and the currently operating reactors Good. for these. All right. Thanks, Bill. That, the, re that's the reviews of the fire protection programs for the new reactors are almost boring because they're so separated. They, there's so few issues that come out. Uh, we do have multiple spurious, but we've addressed that issue on all of the designs. Okay. So I think I, th I think I'm very confident that we've addressed the issues. Good. Good. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Bill, for that clarification. Next one is for Scott. Yeah. You should know that you were going to get a question from me, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I thought I was going to get away with that one. Uh, no. <laughs> okay. So in terms of the Western U.S. Um, you said that you know the Western U.S. poses unique challenges in terms of seismic hazards and flooding hazards and hydrological hazards, I should say, and meteorological conditions. And so I'm wondering if there's, you know, what areas you believe that additional research needs to be done on this. And then I'm also interested in a timeline for the seismic hazard review of the Western U.S. Okay. Uh, you related to the operating reactors or new new reactors? Yeah. Okay. Um, as it relates to, to research, we've been working re with research for some time. We have an integrated uh, research plan that helps support our review activities. We recognize that the Western U.S. would be a, a challenge um, given the number of active faults and really the challenge in terms of trying to define how far out you go in terms of determining whether or not a particular fault has it, the effect on the, on the site. So we've had a lot of research that's done in the past, um, and so we feel as though we're well positioned to do that work. It really gets, the devil gets down to the de into the details of the particular site that you have to evaluate. Mm -hmm. We do anticipate it taking a little bit more time and more effort to do the reviews. Um, it's hard to put an exact year time frame on the reviews, um, but we expect that they would be uh, somewhat longer than the current reviews. However, one of the things that we're really trying to do is have the early engagement, um, the the applicants have started their processes to develop the, their models and techniques, um, and we've been engaging them uh, to understand how that process is going to work. 
So we're hoping that that early interaction and engagement uh, will help for us to have a better, higher quality application. That was one of their challenges with the current set of uh, reviews that we've had. There, a lot of time was spent going back and sending requests for additional information to have them supply us with the appropriate level of technical information. So we're hoping the early engagement will help at least ensure we get the initial application uh, information needs that will help accelerate the time. So it may not be as much of a difference as we thought. Okay. So we're learning from that experience. All right, good. How about tsunami? Well, I was talking primarily about seismic, but right. yeah. the same applies. The same applies true for tsunamis, hazards as well. Um, although right well, now, tsunami hazards aren't limited to the Western U.S. Right, right. So, and we we've, we've been doing that work. We have uh, updated guidance documents that we plan to put out here in the near future that reflects the lessons learned on that part of the process. Okay. Um, thanks, Scott. Okay, so for maybe Glenn, I don't know. Um, in terms of the steam generator issues at San Onofre. I'm interested in the vendor component, okay, here. And so are there any lessons learned that NRO is taking from this whole experience at San Onofre uh, to inform the vendor inspection program? Uh, yeah, if you'd like to, feel free. Well, yeah, um, I think, well, first of all, I think we're still early on in terms of lessons learned because I know they're still evaluating a lot of that. But I will say from a vendor component, we actually had one of our vendor inspectors participate on the AIT with Region 4 uh, to look at, you know, the vendor's role in the design and deployment of those steam generators. And so there were some findings there. And then as a follow-up to that, uh, we are working with Region 4 to actually um, go on a vendor inspection associated with the, those steam generators and focus a little bit more so we can not only look at licensee's root cause, but also uh, vendor issues out at MHI. And then we'll apply them accordingly. Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. I wasn't going to leave you guys out. So. <laughs> uh, so for Victor and Justin. <laughs> um, so you know, I we've had this little bit of a discussion about um, this issue with the the steel plates, the embeds, and Victor. You and I got a chance to chat about this yesterday. You know, good job for finding this first of all. Um, but m more generally. You know, and, and, and the, the uh, findings that you had on the, the um, base mat rebar, do you feel like you're seeing a trend in terms of construction material quality, or is this just to be expected, these issues? And, and I'll let uh, Justin uh, share some thoughts here. Um, there have been issues that uh, we've identified and our licensees have identified associated with, with vendor quality. Uh, as for it being a trend, we've not um, characterized them that way. Uh, they were opportunities, uh, and again, in the cases where, uh, in instances where we identified the, the issues that the licensee didn't, and that was noteworthy. Uh, but there have been other examples, and I'd like Justin to share his thoughts where uh, the licensees did identify them, which is a, mm -hmm. a good observation. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think a lot of the issues that we've seen and that the licensee has seen during their oversight of their vendors are typical construction issues. Okay. They're not standing out like something's broken. It's, uh, you know, of course we want everything to be perfect, right. but, it's, but it's not going to be. And where we have had issues, and some of our issues have really added value, you can go back to, um, you know, the first issue we issued, we had at Vogel had to do with their oversight of the contractor building the containment vessel. Well, they took that finding and they changed their oversight mm -hmm. and their contractor uh, also changed their uh, inspections and quality control uh, to focus more on NQA1, that's a quality assurance requirement. So my point is we are finding, the NRC is fi are, fi are finding issues and the licensee is learning from those issues and making changes to improve. And that's really, I think, what we, all we can ask for at this stage in the game. And having more inspectors at the site like we do, uh, I think we're in a better position to identify trends when they mm -hmm. come up, and we'll be okay. quick to address those. Okay, great, all right. Um, I think that's it for me, so let me see if any of my colleagues wanna make any closing statements. No, no, nothing, okay. Well then, um, 
I really, again, appreciate all your presentations uh, and, and for those of you who traveled to get here for all your, your hard work. Um, and uh, I think this was a, a great opportunity to, to review the new reactor business line. I know that I learned a lot um, and uh, I will now say that we'll adjourn.